Hello, everyone. My name is Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Jason Muabi, a breast medical oncologist from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. With Dr. Muabi, we're hoping to better understand the different histologies we see in hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients, with their focus being on invasive lobular breast cancer. Do we need to treat these patients differently, or do they have better or worse prognosis? Let's get started. Dr. Mwabi, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm uh, very honored uh, to be here in the presence of the Oncology Brothers. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be talking about the invasive lobular carcinoma, a very important subtype of breast cancer that is longly misunderstood and understudied. Yes, to your question is lobular uh, carcinoma is very different than ductal carcinoma, the more common type of cancer. And historically, those two types have been grouped together and studied as a one entity, which was unfair for the lobular patients because the overwhelming majority, 90% of breast cancer are ductal in histology. So the lobular cancers were lost in between those ductal patients in large studies. And the conclusion of those studies were always driven by the ductal histology and not much by the lobular. So we didn't know how well or how poorly they did on those studies. But now we have more and more data looking back in time, looking at outcomes of patients with lobular and comparing them to ductal. And we found that those outcomes are different. And looking at those tumor more at the molecular, genomic, and microenvironment levels, we found that they're very different uh, type of tumors. Lobular cancer is not a rare tumor. A lot of people think because it's only 10 to 15% of breast cancer, it's a rare uh, cancer, but it's not. Uh, we're anticipating uh, this year, the American Cancer Society is anticipating around 54,000 new cases of lobular breast cancer in the U.S. If you put it in perspective, I always like to talk like this with especially pharma folks because I think it's a very small uh, group of patients. It is not. Because if you look at all the triple negatives, that is only 20, well, not only, that is 29,000 new cases this year. And if you look at the HER2 positive, there are about 40,000. So you're talking about lobular, which is more than both, right? Uh, and it has to be studied as its, uh, as its own entity. Now, the far majority of uh, lobular cancers are hormone positive. So as you can see in, in the slide over here from the pie chart, is that 92% uh, of the ILC are uh, hormone positive or 2 negative, whereas only about 55% of ductals are hormone positive or 2 negative. And if you look at the PAM50 intrinsic subtypes, most of those lobular are luminal A. Yet, if you look at their outcome, so by, by them being luminal A, mo most likely hormone positive, somebody would think that, okay, maybe they have better long-term outcome. But no, they do not have lo a better long-term outcome. In fact, the long-term outcome are inferior than those of uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. And this is because it has been uh, not studied correctly and it ha the therapy that uh, are given for lobular have not been optimized. And we're going to talk about it uh, later on today. Uh, lobular uh, cancer, like the, the, the hallmark of it is a mutation in the gene that encode this uh, anchoring protein called E adherent and the gene is called CDH1. So this mutation leads to a defective protein. So those proteins do not go to the surface of cells to anchor them to each other and to the environment but stay in the cytoplasm. And that's why lobular tend to present in a different way. So instead of presenting like not, uh, normal cancer do, they present like an onion, so rings of onion, they grow with a mass. Lobular cancer present as a single pie pattern. So one cell give a rise to daughter cell and a daughter cell and daughter cell, and they go into those streaks of cells that grow into those like rays if you, if, if you want. And because they're not anchored to anything, you cannot feel them. So when you touch them, they keep on moving. So they did not distort the architecture of the breast or any organ that they infiltrate. That's why a lot of time when we catch them, we catch them very late when they're already causing problems. And because of the loss of this anchoring protein, the way they metastasize is different than ductal cells. So they have more peculiar sites that they can go to because of this loss of this anchor that they have. So you see lobular coming a lot in the peritoneal cavity and cause a lot of uh, malignant obstruction. So a lot of the patients that present to us to our practice, this is their first presentation. They were they had this severe constipation. They had they did the colonoscopy. They didn't find a mass, but they found the structure. They biopsied and they found lobular cell in the wall. Same thing in the in the stomach. They find a, a lot of those issues. Also, they can wrap around the ureters and cause elevated uh, uh, creatinine, and that's how they present to us. 
Dr. Mabi, you've mentioned that we often see these patients once they've advanced, but even before we get to that point or start talking about the treatment, in terms of ongoing surveillance or uh, screening, is MRI a better tool or is mammogram good enough for these patients for ongoing screening? Excellent question. Uh, mammogram, uh, so they did the studies before. Mammogram is only sensitive about 40% of the time in detecting lobular. And if the patient has a brand's death, a brand, dense breath, the, this uh, sensitivity goes down to less than 10%. So the mammograms are definitely not the, uh, not the ideal choice for lobular uh, carcinoma yet. This is the screening tool currently available. Now we can improve on the mammogram and there is this new entity called contrast enhanced mammogram. And this one is pretty good at detecting lobular. And I'm hoping there can be more uptake of this contrast enhanced mammography. Here at MD Anderson, we just started doing it. So I can only imagine uh, where other places are at this point in time. Ultrasound has a little bit better sensitivity, but it's only about 60%. So also ultrasound are not ideal. Now mammograms, yes, they have the high sensitivity about 90% plus, but they also have a lot of false positives. And those false positives lead a lot of time to unnecessary extra procedure. And we've seen that because of the uptake of the use of MRIs, we've seen increase in the rate of unnecessary uh, mastectomies and sometimes bilateral mastectomies. So yes, MRI is the most sensitive currently. However, it leads to mm, a lot of false positives leading to more surgery than we would like to. Now, I think the future is going to be more about uh, contrast and head mammography, and uh, those are sensitive for lobular, but they're still being in the works. Now, talking about just imaging aspect of it, and you talked about e and protein tying up to uh, and causing peritoneal involvement, is there more potential for these cancers to cause brain involvement? And would you, in that case, do more frequently MRI brain imaging? That's a very good question. So. If you look at uh, the frequency of uh, uh, lobular going to the brain, it's not intraparenchymally. So it's not uh, causing more in, like inside the brain uh, tumors like the, the one you see with ductals. You see more of leptomeningeal disease uh, with the invasive lobular carcinoma and you see more involvement of the orbits. Uh, those, yes, uh, are at a higher frequency in uh, lobular compared to ductal, but still that frequency is pretty low doing universal screening for those patients uh, uh, for, for brain meds at this point is not part of the recommendation. However, yes, if patient present with symptoms, I would be, I would be having a low threshold to scan their brain. But given that background in mind, we know that these patients do a little worse than invasive ductal carcinoma. They have a different metastatic pattern, but in an early stage, so let's say you have a patient who is sitting in front of you with early invasive lobular breast cancer in your clinic, how do you plan that treatment with this patient given the data we have? Thank you very much for this question. And actually, if there is one thing I want to put across to the community oncologists treating patients with lobular cancer is this slide over here. Historically, before the 90s, we were only giving tamoxifen to those patients because that was the endocrine therapy we have. And then in the mid to late 90s, we started having the emergence of the aromatase inhibitors and start giving those. But still, the majority of lobular cancer patients were getting tamoxifen. We didn't know if it, we know that it worked for ductal because this is the bulk of the patient that were on the studies with tamoxifen, but we didn't really look at uh, lobular and ductal and see if both of them responded the same. And historically, we thought, yes, they respond the same until those two studies here on the uh, right-hand side panel. So the BIC-198 and the ADCSG-08. So those two studies, actually, they were they looked back in time and they found that patient, when, they, when you look at tamoxifen versus anormatase inhibitor, in ductal patients, one study showed that it favored uh, aromatase inhibitor, but the hazard ratio were not that impressive. And in one of them showed there was no difference. However, in lobular cancer, there was clear benefit of aromatase inhibitor. And if you look at in the big 198 study, the hazard ratio was around 0.4. So patient with, who took an AI had 60% better uh, outcomes compared to tamoxifen. And uh, in the ABCSG8, the hazard ratio was 0.24, so around 80% better outcomes in patients who received an AI versus tamoxifen. 
Yet, when you look at the studies that look at the outcome of patient long-term outcome, and you saw that lobular patient that inferior to ductal, those patients, the majority of them receive tamoxifen and not aromatase inhibitor. And I think that's here the key is that lobular cancer are partially resistant to tamoxifen. Not fully resistant, partially. And we did those studies in uh, preclinical models, mainly PDX models. These are uh, engineered uh, uh, mice, if you would like, that, that grow human tissue. So in those mice that grow lobular, human lobular cancer, we found that when you give that tamoxifen, the cancer stop growing for a short period of time and then start growing slowly. So that it doesn't stop those cancer from growing. Whereas those mice, when you give them AI, there is a rest of growth and then regression of the tumor. So tamoxifen is not the ideal choice for patients with lobular cancer. And if, if I want to send to the community, because I see a lot of patients coming to me, they recur it. And the first thing I ask, which aromatase inhibitor, uh, which endocrine therapy you were on initially, it's tamoxifen. Uh, tamoxifen should not be used for those patients. Try to avoid it. Give an aromatase inhibitor. If you cannot do that, then yes, tamoxifen is better than nothing. Still, there is some activity, but not it's not the ideal uh, one. Now, when you look at the aromatase inhibitors, we know that there is two classes of aromatase inhibitor. There is the uh, steroidal one and the non-steroidal one. For lobular, it seems to, to uh, it seems like the steroidal aromatase inhibitor have inferior outcome to the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor and astrozole. And that's that's why XMSA should not be the the drug of choice for those patients. Rather, the drug of choice should be anastrozole or letrozole. So if, if that message, can, I can get it across the community for Lobular, I would have done my job. <laughs> wow. Thanks so much for sharing those important thoughts. So just to clarify, Dr. Moabi, a younger patient or an elderly patient, if low risk or high risk, given the histology of lobular carcinoma, you would be more inclined to use anastrozole and letrozole and neither of exomestane or tamoxifen. That is correct. Thank you. And for your question for the premenopausal female, now lobular always tend to occur either if, if it can occur in young females, it's going to occur in the uh, mid to late 40s. So those patients are very close to menopause. And because usually we're going to do this therapy for five to 10 years, I offer them two things, either other than chemical uh, castration by g giving them a GNRH agonist like Zoladec. And always remember, and, and also for the community, I see it a lot done for breast cancer the every three months is not an appropriate option. The every three months injection of GnRH agonist is for prostate cancer, not for uh, breast cancer. For breast cancer, it should be monthly. Certainly very, very important points. Thank well, you so much. The other option I give them is to get surgery, right? They're close That's to that right. age where Absolutely. they can become postmenopausal. If they don't want those injections, uh, I, I, I send them to my uh, gynecologist colleagues to discuss uh, surgery. Uh, and another thing to put in mind, usually lobular when it presents, it always present as not always, almost like almost always as a higher risk. Those uh, those cancers tend to present bigger than what we expect. They tend to have higher risk for recurrence. Um, so uh, I always tell my patient it's worth the the investment in ovarian function suppression plus the appropriate endocrine therapy. And do we have any data on five years versus seven or ten years of AI in these patients over invasive ductal carcinoma? And so, a uh, very good question. We, we we do not. We know that the higher the risk, the, the more that there is benefit of an extended uh, endocrine therapy. The good thing is that uh, in this San Antonio, the, they presented data about the BCI. There was a poster about the breast cancer index, and they found that it, it is useful for lobular histology. So, if if you have a patient that you don't know if uh, she might benefit from extended endocrine therapy or you should stop at five years, the BCI is an appropriate test for lobular cancer. True. And of course, the use of chemotherapy in these patients. We continue to see less and less use of anthracyclines given the side effects of these agents. But is this one histology that perhaps we need to consider anthracyclines for? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So uh, historically, they, they, they used to say that maybe lobular cancer are not sensitive to chemotherapy like Dr. Cancer. And I, I, I would like to say that is not true. I would, I would like to say that we don't know who would benefit and who would not benefit from chemotherapy and lobular cancer because right now all the studies that we have or the tools that we have mainly in the U.S. are oncotype and the mama print have been studied with ductal patient in, in mind. There was very little lobular cancer patient in those studies. That's why we really don't know whether or not those patients that, that 
present as low risk are in fact high risk or those that are high risk are they truly high risk so we don't know if those patients will benefit from chemotherapy but there was a study that here you are showing on the on the panel on the right hand side that did clearly show that patient with N2 and N3 disease so these are the patient with four or more positive lymph nodes there is clear benefit of chemotherapy and lobular. And if you're going to choose a chemotherapy for those patients, it better be the one containing at the anthracycline. So it's ACT and not TC. Um, so this is one of the clear cut uh, reasons to give chemotherapy and lobular the patient with four and uh, four or more lymph nodes. And if you're going to choose one of them, choose uh, the one that is um, uh, containing the anthracycline. And just to reiterate, the pooled analysis when using anthracyclines did show DFS benefit but did not show OS benefit here. Is that correct to state? That that is correct. That that is correct. Uh, you, we we all know that the OS takes longer time to mature right. those data. Uh, but to yes, here we're following uh, rec uh, recurrence breed. Yep. And continuing on, let's focus on metastatic disease. What did your recent analysis of CDK four six inhibitors in these patients show? So here we we try to uh, to go retrospectively back in time using our comprehensive uh, prospectively collected database to look at the outcomes of patients that receive targeted therapies plus endocrine therapy and look at the outcome based on histology. So we looked at the three histologies, uh, ductal uh, cancer, lobular cancer, and there is a subgroup of patients, very small proportion with, that they have mixed, they have features of ductal and lobular. And we found that in all uh, those three subgroup of patients, if they're hormone positive, they benefited in the same magnitude from endocrine therapy plus a target therapy, which was very reassuring to our uh, lobular breast cancer patient. And it's reassuring to the treating physician that, uh, that is prescribing those medications. Well, thank you for that. But you've mentioned that most of these patients are hormone positive. Yes, we know that. But with TDXD and sasetizumab, these agents are making their way in hormone receptor positive, triple negative, and of course, HER2 positive. Do we have any data on these newer ADCs, such as TDXD and sasetizumab, in invasive lobular carcinoma? We don't have uh, data per se, but I can tell you from my experience and experience of other uh, uh, physicians that treat lobular, because we talked about, about those, you, you are correct and on point. This is something that is very interesting for us, and we want to see if lobular do benefit. And uh, it seems like they do benefit really well from ADCs. So from both and HER2, so I have a few patients in my practice and uh, right now my practice is mainly lobular. I only see uh, lobular. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of colleagues across the nation that similarly, they have a big proportion of lobular. And we see that those two agents, sasituzumab, uh, govitecan, and uh, uh, trastuzumab, deroxtecan, works really well in lobular breast cancer patients. So to your question, yes, I tried to use them after endocrine therapy plus the DK46 inhibition. Well, thank you so much for your time. Just to summarize here, it is important to keep these histologies and intrinsic subtypes in mind when treating our breast cancer patient population. And hopefully more studies in future will help us decide if we need to treat invasive lobular cancer as a separate entity. The important, key thing, important thing to keep in mind is utilizing and astrozole and letrozole mm -hmm. in early stage or premenopausal patient population, and also not shying away from utilization of anthracyclines. Dr. Moabi, thank you for being with us today and sharing your work. Thank you so much. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here.